everybody. I'm glad to see you all here. Thank you very, very much. Uh, as you well know, the minister is on a short vacation, and he's up in Michigan right now, as I understand it, and so it's just uh, wind here. That's, that's what it is. All right, but I want to welcome you all to uh, Rockville First United Methodist Church and our service this morning, and uh, I don't know if we've got any visitors here this morning, but if we do, uh, that's great. Glad to have you. And if it's just the regular members, that's, that's better yet. So thank you so much for coming. Uh, if you could join me in the beginning here with our call to worship, and uh, uh, I will begin it, and then you read your part, if you will. To God's beloved, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Amen. Let us praise our God.
Let's go on to pass it on then. Okay. We always have a glitch. Pass it on. eternal and mighty by your grace you have shown us who you are one in three and three in one we glorify you as Trinity even as we worship you in your unity open our hearts to receive your word to us today and not only in our worship but in our lives we may serve and reflect your triune love all our days. Amen. Please be seated. Our service has been a little bit truncated, so there's things that we normally do that are not here in the bulletin. But one thing I do want to point out on the front cover of your bulletin, you notice the words that it says uh, by Julia Ward Howe, as he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. Well, in Christianity, he died to make men holy, let us live to make men free. So it's just a slight change, nothing really big. I want to talk to you today by, about something very important to me, and that's the church. And I want to say a little poem that you all have memorized. So I want you to say the memorized poem with me. Put your hands up here like this. Pull them back down like that and say, Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the doors and there's the people. Okay. Now, I want to talk to you about church. First, I want to tell you a little bit about the early part of the church here because it's important and many of you may not know the church history some of you may know the church history I was fortunate that Susan Harbison helped me with it along with Karen Woodson and Kathy our church secretary but let me read you just a couple of things here the first log building in Rockville occupied for stated religious services was the old log courthouse this was used until the Birch School House was constructed in 1832. The Methodist 
the Baptists and the Presbyterians were all using this building for religious services. Following this, the new courthouse was used by all denominations. After the Presbyterians built their own church in 1833, the Methodists enjoyed the privilege of frequent use of it. The Methodists built their own wood frame church on West Ohio Street with the parsonage just east of the church in 1837. Their numbers were few and their means small for such an undertaking, but they succeeded in building a large house known as Old Church. It is related that Samuel Knoll mortgaged his farm for the money with which to complete the church. And there possibly were others that did the same. The total cost was $2,500. The Indiana Conference was held in this old church on October 17th of 1838. Uh, this was the only time that the Rockville ever entertained the conference. The pastor at that time was Reverend Cornelius Swank. After using the old church for 28 years, the Methodist Society returned to the old courthouse for services for yet another year. And in 1865, sold the old church to the African Methodists who used it until 1900, when it was finally torn down. A lot was bought on the corner of Market and York Streets in 1865, and Reverend Thomas Meredith began circulating subscriptions for building the new church building. The present Rockville Methodist Church was built in 1868, and then in 1892 it was rebuilt and enlarged. The sale of the South Market Street property made possible the building of a new parsonage on North Market Street in 1904. Now, that pertains to what I'm going to talk about this morning, the reason I brought that up. Now, I'm not particularly smart, but I brought with me a book that I had to buy this spring when I took a course at Asbury Theological Seminary down in Wilmore, Kentucky. And I didn't have to leave my house, I could take it online from my library and study this course. And in this course, uh, I had several textbooks I had to have, but the point was, this particular text was written by a Paul Hebert. Now you say, well, who in the world is Paul Hebert? Well, Paul Hebert was born in India to missionary parents. He was a white man just like the rest of the people that went here. And then he went to school at the Mennonite Brethren Biblical Seminary at the University of Minnesota. And then Hebert went on overseas to be in mission to India. And after that, he uh, came back and taught at Fuller Theological Seminary before becoming a distinguished professor of mission and anthropology at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He was best known for his concept of the excluded middle. Now, I'm not going to get into that. That's the subject of another. But I want to talk to you today about something very important, and that's the church. We're going to look at the church from a different angle. This is not a sermon. This is a message. And I thought it would be best, and I got the approval of Pastor Brian to do this. So let me talk to you about how churches are built and come into being so that you can have a better understanding of that. In long-range planning for churches and planning a new church, because you see, churches aren't just to come every Sunday morning and get together and do church here. They're to reach out beyond the walls and build new churches. And we call that church planting. And, but in order to do that, you have to include the renewal of old churches. Because the old churches have serve a very important purpose. The birth of a new congregation is no guarantee that they will remain spiritually alive. All forms of life involve the process of health and illness. A church can remain vitally alive only as it periodically experiences 
times of renewal. If you don't have church renewal, the churches finally die out. Faith may be something very intense and personal to you, but Christianity is also a community of believers, the church uh, united under the Lordship of Christ. Although the church is a corporate body, it must take on social forms. Without these forms, there would be no relationship among believers and no visible congregation. The church is not just a social organization. It is the body of Christ and the Spirit of God at work within us. Let us look at the process of institutionalization of the church. The church, as it undergoes changes, can be analyzed by looking at the successive generations of people within a particular institution, just like you heard about our church beginning. The first generation is made up of the founding fathers and mothers who are drawn together by a vision of something new for which they have paid a high price. Often they have left an old institution to join a new movement. Friends and relatives have sought to draw them back, and when that failed, they cut them off. They have faced a high risk, for there is no assurance that the new organization they have founded would survive. Cut off from their old world, they are bound together by strong ties of fellowship and oneness of purpose. The new converts are like first-generation members. Therefore, they too have paid a high price to leave the old and join the new. Now, the second generation is made up of the children of the founders of the church. Here, major and structural changes take place. While the founders paid a high price to leave their old institutions to form a new one, the children grow up within the framework of the new institution and its programs. The cost for them is not so high, but neither is their necessary commitment. Members of the second generation do grow up during the excitement, the sacrifice, and the commitment of the new movement, but they acquire a second-hand vision that motivated their parents. By the time you get to the third, fourth, and fifth generation, the new movement has become an establishment. In these churches, the children go to Sunday school, go to youth meetings with their friends. With these friends, they make a profession of faith and are baptized. To remain within the institution is the path of least resistance and cost. The life of the church, like any institution, depends upon one generation succeeding another. But the weakness of these successive generations is that each become less and less committed. What began as a movement has become a bureaucratic organization. Over the generations, the organization grows and matures. And with mature and maturation come with the problems of middle age, loss of vision for the church, and a hardening of the category. Now there are benefits to this institution. There is the lift for the second generation. Their children usually get good education and become the community leaders, not only in the church, but throughout the community. The danger is that with this rise of the social class, there is no longer witness effectively to that community that maybe was even what we call the church. The second benefit to this institutionalization is efficiency. New decisions are made within the church for each activity. Programs get done faster. Habit formation becomes the norm, and creative becomes routine for making decisions. A third benefit 
of the institutional agencies is the ability to mobilize large members of people and resources to carry out otherwise impossible programs and missions and ministry. A fourth benefit is the theological maturation of the church. Some of the people of the church become miniature Bible scholars, have a much deeper understanding of the Bible and its message. The long-range survival of the church is dependent upon members of the congregation, other than the minister, to be able to explain what passages the Bible mean and have a deep understanding of the scriptures. Now, there are dangers to the institutionalization. What began as a means to help the congregation can end in a way to strangle it. For an example, let us say, in order to evangelize, evangelize the community, the church forms a committee. The committee wants to keep minutes, so they hire a secretary within themselves to send out letters and make reports. In the end, the secretary and the other letter writers see little connection between those tasks and evangelization, evangelization of the neighborhood. Churches that were organized to evangelize use up more and more of their time and resources for self-maintenance and maintaining the institution. Whereas young churches often make do with the simplest of facilities, the older churches spend more and more of their time maintaining the sanctuaries, the air conditioning, the carpeting, and making bulletins baking cookies, and paying the administration less of the resources on evangelism. Can you see what is beginning to happen here? We're moving away from the light. We're moving away from the vision of the church. What was the purpose of the church? What was the coming together to make a church, to now maintaining a church? Now you may say, well, that's not us. That's not the way we do it here. I'm talking in churches in total. And how did I find it out? Through Paul Hebert's book. And why did I learn it through that? Because as I went from church to church to church to church throughout western Indiana, I started seeing this pattern. That people came here, got here right on time, had church right on time, and started doing the things in a very ritualistic method, which is good to some sort, but there was no reaching out. There was no excitement in the service. That is the reason I put in your bulletin part of my research, and that is how to build a very effective church. And this is not one person thinking, this is many churches that were very successful came together in order to make what is happening successful in each church. Not just this church, but in all churches. The things that it takes to keep people coming back and coming back and coming back. So what are the things that we can work on in order to avoid becoming this institutionalized church? Well, one of the things is prayer praying for each other. And you might say, well, we already do that. Well, okay. But there is prayer for many of the people who are not here this morning. Then there are prayer for those who have gone from here to maybe a nursing home or rehab. Then there is prayer for those people who used to come to the church but are not coming to the church anymore. So there's many different ways of looking at prayer. Then the most important thing is conversion. The conversion in an institution is not just the coming up here and giving your life to Christ, but it's a whole change of life, a whole change in the way you behave within the church. Now what am I talking about? I'm talking about that when you come into the church, instead of greeting your friends and talking to your friends, you reach out and say, let me tell you what Christ did for me this week. I had a terrible case of cancer. And God has turned it around in my life. I got hurt. God helped me. 
I had a financial problem. And I didn't know how to solve it. But God helped me in so many different ways. And it made me much stronger. And I start to see what God is doing in my life. And I want to tell you about it. Not just on Sunday morning, but throughout the week. Now, once you know this, then you start looking at the second generation, the third generation, and the fourth generation. And the children that are growing up within the church. The young ones. People love to see children in the church because they see that's the future of the church. And as they see that, children have a way of making friends. And when they make friends, within those friendships, they develop a lot of whether they're going to become Christians or not. How they're going to believe for the rest of their life. And it's terribly and terribly important on how they see themselves within the church and if they can grasp back the vision of the old church that it once started. But then there is another thing in all these. And that, in this pattern of renewal, is the beginning of a new institutional movement. Many people don't realize it, but some people will just walk out of here and form another church. Form another church? Yes. Back in 1703, a man was born who didn't really like his church. It was the Church of England. He didn't really like how they had become so institutionalized, how they were spending their resources for things just to keep up the church, but they weren't really reaching out and evangelizing. So he decided to do something about it. And the harder he worked at it, the more he found what was important in life. And his life was changed in 1738. And when that happened, then he was better able to reach out and form churches. He not only formed hundreds and hundreds of churches, but from those churches were members and people who reached out and they formed more churches. And they started forming thousands and thousands of churches. The movement spread to America. And not only from America, it then spread out to Africa, it spread out to India, it spread out to New Guinea, it spread out to many different places in what we call missions. All because this fellow didn't like the way church was being run so institutionally. This same thing can happen in every church. It makes no different which church it is. I want to leave this challenge to you. While there is still time, reach out to the members of this church and challenge them with a new vision of the light. And what is the light? It's the light of Christ. It's the light of Christ and what he's doing throughout the world. He's constantly knocking on the doors of people's lives. And by doing that, he's reaching out to make new converts. Converts for Christianity. I want to thank you very much this morning. And so now, will the... Uh, uh, anybody who would like to be a, uh, an usher would like to come forward, we'll take the morning tithes.
if we can offer the prayer in the bulletin here. Holy Lord, the whole earth is full of your glory. We are in awe of your majesty. In the greatness, and you reveal yourself in the one who forgives us. You give us gifts and invite us to go into the world to tell your good news. Help us to respond in faith and go where you lead us each day. We dedicate our gifts so that our community will draw us closer to you. Amen. Okay, now let's have our last hymn here. of our Lord Jesus Christ in the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Go in peace to love and serve our tribune God. Thanks be to God. Thank you for coming.